We have reached the end of our first season, I say that very particularly. Our first season, uh, really a tremendous uh, work of 20 weeks. Kola Kavot to all of you for coming out week after week after week to learn. I don't know, uh, what's everyone going to do on Monday night next week? Pesach, Pesach. Oh, Pesach, anyway. uh, Tonight's class uh, has been very generously sponsored by all of you. Um, in honor of me, I'm very touched and honored uh, uh, on that account, and uh, I see that there are a number of books as we put in the, uh, in the, in the uh, book, and I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Len uh, Mendel to actually share a few words regarding our sponsorship tonight before we begin, so uh, please. I uh, want, I'm honored to have the opportunity to personally thank on behalf of all of us, Rabbi Freundlich, for the work which he has put in, and I think on behalf of all of us who have attended all or some or many of the lectures, uh, it has been a truly wonderful, wonderful experience. For some, and I expect for many, this has been an introduction to some of our great rabbis, going back to Rashi, Judah Halevi, and uh, finally tonight, uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik. And parenthetically, Rabbi Soloveitchik was first introduced to me many years ago by our founding rabbi, David Hartman. That's going back a lot of years. And maybe it was his father? I'm not sure, but uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik. The uh, countless hours that you have put into this thing are very, very much appreciated. and. Uh, I imagine that uh, rounding up and, and, and uh, attending the, the guest lectures has been a wonderful experience for us, but you have given the bulk of the lectures, Rabbi Freund, and we do appreciate it very, very much. And we recognition of this, in recognition of this we have obtained uh, books on some of the great rabbis, which in your honor, will be placed in the Shul Library. Amazing. Again, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you all. This is, this is really the most fitting tribute. Wait, you walked off with my notes. <laughs> If, if I were really impressed, I would have pretended like it didn't happen and done the whole thing by heart. But I, I just remember, if I can give you a test of who's the one we spoke about who did that. But I'm worried, we'll leave that alone. Hey, this is really the most tri uh, a, a fitting tribute and touching tribute um, that we should have in our library, that they should be used in our library, all of the great books. Uh, uh, that we've done, and I very much uh, thank you all. I'm just re I'm recording this audio recording. I'm not uh, checking my phone while I'm speaking to you. Okay. Um, so really, the most tri tri uh, fitting tribute. I very much appreciate it. None of this could have happened without you. None of this could have happened without you coming in uh, week in and week out uh, to come and to learn and the excitement uh, that this class has generated uh, and the learning that this course has uh, generated uh, really speaks for itself and the crowds that have come. It's very, uh, very moving and very fitting. And, uh, and I appreciate that. Looking forward to uh, next season. But uh, we have a lot to do tonight still. Um, as we uh, as we conclude our course, so and further, we just announce one more last uh, again. I'll we'll announce again at the end. This coming Shabbos, we'll have our official seum. Um, uh, this entire course has been sponsored by the Weinberg family in memory of uh, Dr. Mark Weinberg, um, and we'll have a special seum with a special guest uh, speaker. Rabbi Dalia Berg will be here an hour before Mincha, 5:45. Seum, special yard site uh, lecture in memory of Mark, whose yard site is in the month of Nissan. Followed by a shalosh is sponsored by the Weinberg family, and Zev will be in town. Uh, we'll share a few words about his father, so please join us for that special conclusion of this entire uh, course as we thank the Weinbergs for really making this whole thing possible. 
Tonight's final uh, lecture is on the, uh, the Rav, uh, Rabbi Yosef Dov Salavecha Kalevi, uh, the great Rosh Hashiva from Yeshiva University. Um, I, I begin with the words of uh, Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb. Rabbi uh, Lamb was the president, the chancellor of Yeshiva University for over 35 years, from the mid-70s till his retirement in, I think it was 2013. Um, and in his eulogy of the Rav, uh, which he gave not at the time of his death, but several years later, at one of the memorials that they had, uh, he opened by saying that the Rav was so enormous, was so multifaceted, that there really isn't anybody who could have given appropriate eulogy for him other than Rasal himself. There is nobody who can encompass all that he was. Now, Rabbi Lam was, is no intellectual slouch himself. He is well-published... Uh, quite a brilliant speaker and orator and writer, and for him to say that there's really nobody around who can summarize the life of the Rav, so I follow in his footsteps and really have very little to be able to offer to try uh, to do so. I feel doubly uh, not uh, less than qualified to do so because out of all the figures that we've learned, the Rav was actually, uh, he died in 1993 which means that there are many, many, many students of his who are still alive today. My students, when I was in high school, I went to MTA, Yeshiva University's high school. My students were almost all students of his, direct students of his. Um, and many of uh, my colleagues are students of his students or direct students of his. And because of that, as opposed to all the historical figures that we've studied, so we can share whatever we can about them, but they're all a historical figure. When we speak about the Rav, which we'll do tonight, I know that there are so many people today who, if they were to hear the words that I would share, and I stand in um, pretty good confidence that they won't hear the words that I'm going to be sharing today, but if they would, they would all say, you know, das is nicht you, you didn't do a good job. They didn't really describe, there, you covered this, but there was so much more about that aspect or this facet of him. And, and how could you do that all in, in an hour? It, it doesn't work. The, the books that have been written just since his passing, the 25th anniversary was just last year uh, of his passing, read by Herschel Schechter, uh, current Rosh Hashiva in Yeshiva University, one of his primary students has written at least, that I know, three Hebrew volumes uh, detailing his life and his experiences with Rabbi Berkefer, wrote a two-volume English book. Um, Rabbi J.J. Schachter, also a student of his, has an eight-series uh, online lecture that you can listen to detailing his life, and dozens and dozens and dozens of articles and essays and talks uh, that have been given. It, it, it's enormous, and so I, I know that we're not going to do it justice, and so with that disclaimer, we're going to begin. I have tried as much as possible to use the words of his students. Um, I gave you in your handout in front of you as many quotes as I can so that we can allow his actual students to speak for themselves, and as well as what we always do in this course to try to actually study some of his works. There are going to be three of his works. He published over 25 books, um, besides for dozens of essays. Um, and so we'll, we'll still focus on three um, in your addendum uh, to try to give a taste, and it's just going to be a taste of what he was and who he was through the words of his students and through his own words. With that, let's begin with the introduction. Dr. David Schatz who uh, is a professor today in Yeshiva University in Stern, and I actually was a classmate of his son uh, when I was in high school. He writes the following in his introduction to uh, The Lonely Man of Faith, which we'll get to a little bit later this evening. Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik was not only one of the outstanding Talmudists of the 20th century, but also one of its most creative and seminal Jewish thinkers. His stature was such that he was widely known simply as the Rav, the Rabbi Par. Excellence. Drawing from a vast reservoir of Jewish and general knowledge, Rabbi Salvechik brought Jewish thought and law to bear on the interpretation and assessment of the modern experience. On the one hand, he built bridges between Judaism and the modern world, yet at the same time, he vigorously upheld the integrity and autonomy of the Jews' faith commitments. And the reason why I wanted to bring this quote to begin with is because it touches on a lot of the points that we're going to speak about. Number one, he was an outstanding Talmudist. First and foremost, the Rav was a Talmud Chacham par excellence, and we're going to talk about his, his abilities in learning the type of shiurim that he gave, but he was also creative, a creative thinker, a seminal creative thinker of the Jewish world in the 20th century, a philosopher who has shaped the way the American Jewish community thinks. Literally, the way we think is using his eyeglasses and the way that he gave us uh, a vision of certain things, and we'll cover many of those uh, as we go through tonight as well. 
He mentions drawing from the reservoir both of Jewish and general knowledge. We'll see how highly educated he was in the secular world as well. And his goal of the modern experience. Taking the Jew, he was the Rav from 1903 to 1993. He lived in the 20th century. And he was going to bring the halachic Jew into this modern world of America that we found ourselves in post-World War II, which was the shtetl and the world of Europe. And now we're here in the Golden of Medina, the modern world of America. And how does a modern but halachic Torah Jew bridge these gaps of what were two different worlds? And that was going to be one of the primary things that he was going to help us with, vigorously upholding the integrity and autonomy of his faith, yet dealing with and bridging the modern uh, world. Let's, do, let's start with a little biographical uh, sketch. So the first thing we need to know about the Rav is that he came from a royal Torah heritage, literally royalty. Uh, born in 1903 in what was then uh, Russia, became Poland and Belarus. Uh, but he was from a rabbinic dynasty that was a 200-year-old rabbinic dynasty. We're going to run through this quickly with these names. We've covered, actually, some of these names in our, in our classes. His grandfather, his father's father was the great Rabbi Chaim Soloveitchik. His great-grandfather, and his namesake was Rabbi Yosef Dov Soloveitchik, who wrote the Sefer known as the Beis Alevi. His great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, excuse me, Natal Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, the Nitziv, who was the Rosh Hashiva in Valazhin, and then his great-great-great-great-grandfather was Rav Chaim Valazhin, who we studied together, was the student of the Vilna Gon, the founder of the Valazhin or Yeshiva. So he literally was a direct line what, from what we would consider the nobility, the royalty, the, the dynasty of the Soloveitchik uh, namesake in, uh, in Torah. And from his mother's side, uh, he as well was the grandson of uh, Rabbi Leo Feinstein, um, who was a descendant of a long line of uh, rabbis tracing themselves back to the Tosas Yontem, the Shlod, the Marshal, and all the way back to Rashi. So he, he was coming from quite a line. Now, there are those who we can give an entire class just on his lineage. We're going to mention it just to understand where he was coming from. His father, uh, Ramosha Salvechik, was actually the head of the rabbinical school at Yeshiva University of Reeds, or Rabbi Yeshiva uh, Yitzchak El Hanan. And he succeeded his father, which we'll speak about in a few moments. So he is from a long line of, uh, of rabbis. He was given a traditional Talmud Torah education, recognized as a genius um, very, very early on. There are different reports. I, I mentioned this. It's clear that at some point he had a malamed. His main rebbe was his father until his early 20s. And he considered his father to be his rebbe, quoted him uh, all the time as his rebbe. At some point in his younger years, he had a malamed who was a Chabad uh, malamed. And there are different reports. I don't know what really happened. It's hard for me to be able to decipher from the different ways it's coded, whether or not it was unbeknownst or by his mother or his father. At some point, he, he, this Chabad, Malami uh, taught him the Tanya, which, which we had a whole class on, the first uh, Lubav, uh, Chabad Rebbe, the Baal Tanya, and uh, mystical uh, teachings. And then his parents, uh, his father, who comes from this long line of Litvaks, very anti uh, Hasidish, you know, pulled him out and said, you're going to learn with me uh, from, from here on out. But there are different reports as to the type of influence that that had on him from being exposed to uh, Hasidus at a very young age. He was clearly a, quite a precocious and a, uh, a brilliant uh, child, and, uh, at which he followed his entire life. And by the age of 10, we already have reports of Chedusha that he was writing, his own novel Torah thoughts that he would show to his father, that his father took to his father, Reb Chaim Salavechik, who shared with his base medrash. He was already... Uh, already well-known and recognized as a sign of the Soloveitchik uh, Talmudic dynasty. But what I want to share, besides for all the learning that he picked up and the brilliance in Torah from his father and his grandfather, he credits his mother for giving him his religious soul. And I want to share with you a piece that he wrote because it's such a moving uh, piece. It's the first piece in your addendum on page four. No, nope, I'm sorry. It's on page uh, five. A tribute to the Rebbetzin of Talmud, which was his mother, he published in 1978. And the context that he's describing the different elements that a child picks up from his mother and from his father, the different types of learning that one gets. And he says, I, I admit, is on the bottom of page five again, that I am not able, this is his words, to define precisely the, the Mesorah, the traditional role 
uh, should be of the Jewish mother. I can't define it precisely, but what I'm going to do is by circumscription, I hope to be able to explain it. So he writes, permit me to draw on my own experiences. I used to have living conversations, long, excuse me, long conversations with my mother. In fact, it was a monologue rather than a dialogue. She talked, and I happened to overhear. <laughs> what did she talk about? I must use a halachic term in order to answer this question. She talked, mi'inyana diyom, of whatever was going on in the day, a yantiv, a Shabbos, whatever was coming up. I used to watch her arranging the house in honor of a holiday. I used to see her recite prayers. I used to watch her recite the Sidra every Friday night, going over the parsha, and I still remember the nostalgic tune that she would use. I learned from her very much. Most of all, I learned that Judaism expresses itself not only in formal compliance of the law, but also in a living experience. She taught me that there is a flavor, a scent, a warmth to mitzvot. I learned from her the most important thing in life, to feel the presence of the Almighty and the gentle pressure of His hand resting upon my frail shoulders. Without her teachings, which quite often were transmitted to me in silence, I would have grown up as a soulless being, dry and insensitive. The laws of Shabbat, of Shabbat, for instance, were passed on to me by my father. They were part of Musr Avicha, the teachings of one's father. But the Shabbos as a living entity, as a queen, that was revealed to me by my mother. It's part of what we call Torah Imecha. The father knew much about Shabbos. The mothers lived Shabbos, experienced her presence, and perceived her beauty and splendor. The fathers taught generations how to observe the Shabbos. Mothers taught generations how to greet Shabbos and how to enjoy her 24-hour presence. Beautiful tribute to his mother, a sign of a dynasty of Talmudic genius. And he writes, but it was my mother that taught me how to live it, how to experience the beauty of Shabbos, to greet the queen and enjoy her presence. My father taught me what to do and what not to do, how I can make tea on Shabbos and how I can't make tea on Shabbos. My father taught me that, but my mother taught me what it meant to have a queen in the house and how to enjoy, enjoy her presence. Beautiful piece in tribute to his, uh, tribute to his mother. Now, besides for his uh, Torah education, which he received, uh, he was also extensively, secularly educated. Um, he attended the Polish, uh, Free Polish University in Warsaw in 1924 for a number of semesters, and then transferred to the University of Berlin in 1926, where he earned a PhD in philosophy, studied economics, political science, as well as some Hebrew subjects, um, and was well-versed well in, uh, in all of these subjects, all the while continuing his learning in, in Torah. Uh, during this time in Berlin, a fascinating time in Berlin, he was acquainted with both Rabbi Nachman Mendel Schneerson, who became uh, the Lubavitch Rabbi, as well as Rabbi Yitzchak Kutner, who was the Rosh Hashiva of Yeshiva Chaim Berlin in New York. And these three giants, giants of American Judaism of America in the 20th century were together in Berlin in the early 1920s and were all acquainted with each other and maintained their friendship and their communication. We have records of that throughout their lives in the U.S. despite the fact that all three of those yeshivas went in vastly different directions, Chabad, Chaim Berlin, and Yeshiva University. The three heads who studied together in their youth always maintains a connection. There's many stories about that, which is beyond the scope of our uh, brief time tonight, but the fascinating historical uh, 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 um, footnote. In 1932, recently married, the Rav leaves uh, with a young child to the U.S. Now, to get into the U.S. at the time was not simple. There were very tight immigration laws during that time. We were just coming out of the Depression. And the only way that he was able to get into the country was he was sponsored by uh, what it was today known as Agudus Yisrael, the Agudus uh, Union of, I forget exactly what it was called, but the, uh, the Agudus Arabanim, uh, which sponsored him to come over. And the way that they sponsored him was by giving him a job in Chicago, in the uh, Chicago, um, oh, I forget what it's called. Um, go ahead, did I put it there? No, the, the, the theological seminary, the yeshiva in Chicago, was going to give him a, a position, um, and he made it to New York. He uh, uh, was on a ship. 
um, which uh, happened to have docked here in Halifax for a little bit of time before continuing on to New York. Um, and there was a major party there to greet him, the sign of the dynasty, the child of the Rosh Hashiva, current Rosh Hashiva at the time of, of Yeshiva University, his father and Moshe, and he was detained in Ellis Island for, for many, many hours. All the reports that describe his arrival describe that he was detained there. And it seems the reason why he was detained is because by the time he got there, Chicago had pulled the offer off the table. They said, we don't have any money. They were in the pre Depression, coming out of the Depression, 1932. They said, we can't pay him a salary. So they put the ball back in a goodness court, and they said, you sponsor him. You originally had sponsored him to give him a job. In Chicago, we don't have a job. So uh, they couldn't find him a job. In New York, Yeshiva University, where his own father was with Yeshiva, had no money. They couldn't offer him anything. And there was a whole to-do as to how he was going to get into the country. And we have letters published um, of um, almost sort of like advertising this tremendous Talmud Chacham who had arrived on the shores of New York, this young upper 20s, um, until they finally found him a position in Boston. And he moved to Boston to become the chief rabbi of Boston. It was a conglomerate of 11 different shuls in the Boston area, and he became involved in all of that area. It seems in the beginning that wasn't so thrilling because in 1935 he applies to become the chief rabbi in Tel Aviv. So this is shortly after arriving in the shores of New York, and he's one of the final three, uh, three finalists for the position in Tel Aviv, and he travels for his prava to Tel Aviv, it's the only trip in his entire life that he will make to Israel, which we'll speak about in a little bit. This is his only time there. He spends a number of weeks uh, interviewing. Actually has an uh, interview with uh, Rav Cook, who passes away later that year. So Rav Cook is at the end of his life. He's already ill. Rav Cook said about the Rav, about Rav Soloveitchik, after his meeting, he said with him, this reminds me for the first time of my own youth in the yeshiva of Valazhin. Rav Kook had studied with the Rav's grandfather, Rav Chaim of Elazhin. This reminds me of my time in yeshiva with Rav Chaim. Rav Chaim uh, Salavet, Rav Chaim Elazhin was way before the Rav, uh, with, uh, with Rav Chaim Salavetchik. And I see that the brilliance of the grandfather is now held by, by the grandson. Um, and in a great historical divine orchestration of events, the Rav loses the election and is not chosen to be the Rav in Tel Aviv, and instead returns to Boston, where he will live for the rest of his life as the Rav uh, in Boston, and eventually is in uh, YU as well. Who got the job? Uh, Rabbi uh, Bigdor Amiel uh, got the job in, uh, in Tel Aviv. In 1959, parenthetically, I put in the notes, um, he was uh, solicited by the rabbinate in Israel to become the chief rabbi after of Yitzchak Herzog's death, to take over the position of the chief rabbi of Israel. He declined. He was already where he was, and he was not interested in uh, going for whatever reasons, uh, which are not relevant to us uh, tonight. Now, in Boston, he opens in 1937, two years later, the very first Jewish day school in New England, which he calls the Maimonides School, an elementary school. And in this opening, besides for the momentous occasion that he now opened up this... Uh, this school, uh, he begins, I don't know if this is the first, but one of the early significant uh, positions that he took, which was a, so to speak, daring position in the, in the, in the time, which was co-education, boys and girls learning together. Remember, we are in 1937. Uh, we are still uh, in the old shtetl world of Europe, and in the, in the shores of America, the rub held, that's not going to work. And he instituted in an orthodox school in Maimonides in Boston that the boys and girls would learn together, and they would learn Talmud together, and that's the way to be. I want to share his words. as a letter that he wrote many years later in 1953, which expresses it. A letter to uh, Rabbi Leonard Rosenfeld. He writes on the top of page 2, As to your question with regards to a curriculum in a co-educational school, I expressed my opinion too long ago that it would be very regrettable oversight on our part if we were to arrange separate Hebrew courses for girls. Not only is the teaching of Torah Shabal Pep permissible to girls, and I remember there's a major discussion of whether or not one is allowed to teach the oral law to girls. It stems from a Rambam, based on a Gemara, who wrote that one should not teach the oral law to girls. And that was, the Rambam lived in the 1100s, 1200s. That was the standard, that was the way that it was for many, many hundreds of years. And in the, certainly the more, what we would call today Haredi, right-wing worlds, it was for sure uh, Sarah Schneerson is just beginning to teach a base Yaakov of any edge, but that was strictly to girls. And the Rav is now putting them together, and he says it's permissible. Not only is it permissible, but nowadays, 
absolute imperative. This policy of discrimination between the sexes as the subject matter and method, which is still advocated by a certain group within our Orthodox community, has contributed greatly to the deterioration and the downfall of traditional Judaism. Boys and girls alike should be introduced into the inner halls of Torah Shabbat Peh. Torah Shabbat Peh is our lifeline. That's our life. Bro. That's what we have as Jews. You can't keep that away. You have to teach them. You have to teach them together. And he was the pioneer in today what's a standard modern Orthodox education that they'll be taught together. In 1937, he already introduced this into uh, Maimonides. And when it was introduced at the college level in Stern College, Yeshiva University's College for Women, Stern College, and of course, there was a whole to do. They were going to teach Talmud to girls in the Stern College. He said, I'm giving the first year. And he came and he delivered the first lecture in Talmud to girls at Stern College. Um, because of his position that he felt uh, how significant uh, that was. So that's, he's in Boston, again, 1932, 33, he begins in Boston. 37, he opens up the first elementary school. His father dies in 1941, several years later. And he then succeeded him as the head of the yeshiva. His father was the head of Yeshiva University at the time. He succeeded him, um, and he remained there until 1986, some 45 years that he taught in Yeshiva University. Um, at which point he was recognized as its foremost Rosh Yeshiva, even though that was never an official title. You know, the official title of uh, Rosh Yeshiva, but everybody recognized him as such, but he never moved to New York. For 45 years, he lived in Boston. He had a shul in Boston, his Yeshiva, uh, the Maimonides School, and he commuted to New York uh, back and forth uh, weekly, at different times of his life, he had different uh, schedules, how, how often he went back and forth. Um, and there are many, many stories from him uh, on the trains and uh, getting rides. And he was a commuter for all of those years. He had an apartment on Yeshiva University's campus, which he lived during the week when he was there. Um, um, and that's how, he, uh, that's how he did it. Over those 45 years, he ordained over 2,000 rabbis, which has placed the undeniable stamp, his undeniable stamp, on the modern Orthodox Jewish world of North America, because from those 2,000 rabbis over those 45 years, that is the North American rabbinate of the modern Orthodox uh, uh, world. And what's fascinating, and again, if we have more time, we can go through this in more detail, is the wide range, the diversity of the student, the rabbi, who calls the Rav his Rebbe. From uh, more right-wing, what we would call uh, yeshivish YU, to more left-wing orthodox and everything in between, the spectrum of rabbis who would say, the Rav, he's my Rebbe. I learned with him, I learned by him, um, is a tribute to the genius of the Rebbe who gave forth so many different, um, so many different colors uh, within, uh, within the Jewish people. Okay, that's a brief biography. Let's, uh, let's get into some of what he uh, stood for. Now, the first place, you cannot start without his learning and Torah scholarship. First and foremost, he was, uh, he was a giant, just a giant. He was a powerhouse in sheer. He was forceful and he was frightening. Uh, and I use that word very specifically because all of the reports about what it was like to be in Yashir, particularly in the 50s and the 60s, and those who got him towards the end, he already had mellowed. But in the early years, was a frightening experience because he demanded and expected that when you were in Shear, you were prepared. And the questions that you would ask would be on task. And if you didn't measure up, he would let you know. Rabbi Beryl Wine, who's not a student of his, but had a lot of interactions, tells that when he was a teenager, he lived in Chicago, Rabbi Wine, so he went, uh, uh, he was recruited, as was as is the case, by a bunch of yeshivas in other areas to come join. He was in yeshiva in Chicago, and the other yeshivas would go and say, come to our yeshiva. So he went on a trip one summer to three yeshivas, to Lakewood in New Jersey, to Tells in Cleveland at Yeshiva University in New York. He ended up staying in Chicago, but he, he tells about his experience checking out the yeshivas as a teenager. So after going to Lakewood, he went to YU to sit in the Rav Shear. He's a teenager, 18, 19. So he, he shows up in Shear. So uh, he didn't know that you know how to do that. So one of the boys stopped him and said, uh, you know, who are you? What are you doing here? So he said, they're a wine from Chicago, which they were not impressed. They were, they, <laughs> said, so they said, you, 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 can't, you can't just come into Shear. It doesn't work that way. So uh, he said, listen, I came to check it out from Chicago. So the guy said, I'll tell you what, it's the summertime now. And the Rav gives his shear with the door open in, in the summer. Stand, you know, he'd hang out, out when he comes, after he comes in, you'll come stand right outside the room. You'll be able to hear, but uh, don't come inside. 
said, okay. So he started a two and a half hour shear. And Rabbi Wein says, like, unbelievable. He says, it's like nothing he had ever heard. He stills, he says, I remember today. And he says over the Torah that he remembers the, the rabbis of Masechta and Gittin. He was giving shear on a machlokas between the Raivet and the Rashba. He says, it's an unbelievable thing. Two and a half says, But in the middle of the shear, he called on some poor chap to read uh, one of the sources. And the guy had not prepared it appropriately. And he read it wrong. And, and Rabbi Wein says, and he laced into him. He tore him to shreds that he totally misread the whole shear. And Rabbi Wein says, I was outside and he couldn't even see me. And I was shaking in my pants like the fear that he had. And Rabbi Wein said, I decided right then and there, he said, I'm an only son in my family. I've been pampered my whole life. I'm not coming into this classroom, whatever. <laughs> he went back to Chicago and he stayed there. Um, but that is uh, report after report, the description of what it was like, a terror of La Amito Shel to understand and to get it right. Uh, and the pressure, you know, in today's day and age, it made the news. A college basketball coach yelled at one of his players <laughs> and made the news. How could he do that? It's not, it's not nice and public and all this thing. Different, that was what he learned from his father, and that is how we, uh, he, he gave Shear. As a teacher, he kept his students in awe of his wisdom and in fear of his Rabbi Rav Shechter. Kurt Rosh Hashiv in NYU, I mentioned with all the books, was a primary student. It's very hard to listen to Rav Shach, There's many, many lectures about his, his Rebbe, the Rav, and it's very hard to listen to, hard to listen to his point because he literally cries through the whole thing. You listen to him, he has many on why you told if you go, you, you know, to check a Rav Shachter on the Rav, he has many, many lectures, and he literally just cries through the whole thing. It, it's hard to, it's, it's so poignant. And he always says, I see him in front of me always, so it's not like recollections, because all the titles are, you know, recollections or tributes, and he says, he's in front of me, uh, he's in front of me. So he, in one of his lectures, he says that he once asked a question in Shear, and the Rav didn't appreciate the question. That he said, you're asking me a question, it was on a, on a Tosos, one of the commentaries, and you're asking, because you don't understand the Tosos, that's why you're asking me the question. So Rav Shechter reports in his, in his tribute, he said, he, he says this laughing now, he said, he gave me a curse, so to speak, he said, ah! You should live long enough that you finally understand the Tysus. That's, that's how, uh, he's like, you should, you should, hopefully one day, uh, one day you'll get it. And he always believed that the way that orthodoxy was going to capture uh, the American Jewish community was through his intellect, through intellectual and ethical propriety, and that's going to carry the modern world, um, that was going to carry the modern world. As Rosh describes, it, it, was, it was all came from a passion for truth. He had a passion for truth. Um, and understanding what would often happen if Shechter says he's coming to Shir, you gave Shir a week, and then he'd come in the following week, and he would start Shir and he'd say, Everything I said last week is wrong. <laughs> he said, I thought about it all through Shabbos, and the Pshat that I gave the understanding, I don't like it. It doesn't sit well with me. And he would take the whole thing apart and he'd start again. And he would say, He would say this always, he says, He got that from his grandfather. His grandfather, Reb Chaim Salavechik, was he, when he was given a problem in Valajan to become a Rebbe, it was a big to-do, it was a whole historical thing whether or not he was going to be a Rebbe because he was a son-in-law of the Nitziv, the Rosh Yeshiva, so people said he doesn't really deserve it, there's all to do. So they gave him a problem. They invited all the great Rabbanim to come listen to Reb Chaim Salavechik, the Rav's grandfather, give a shear in Valajan to see whether or not he was qualified to get to the position. And he was given a shear, it was a brilliant shear, and halfway through the shear he stops. He was giving a shear in the Rambam, and he said, oh, wait. He said, I just remembered there's a comment that the Rambam makes in his commentary to the Mishnah, which is not nearly studied as often as the Rambam's major works. And he pulled that from the shelf, the comment, the Rambam, he looked it up, and he said, oh, what I'm saying can't be, because I see based on this comment over here, it doesn't make sense. And he closed all of his books, and he said, I don't know, that's, this is what I'm saying is wrong. On his prophet to become the Rabbi. So the Rabbanim all got together, and they said, afterwards, they said, a Rabbi who's ready to do that. The embarrassment for the pursuits of truth on a comment that none of us knew. He could have just ignored the whole thing and nobody would have said anything. That's the Rebbe that we want to have. And the Rav used to quote that story all the time because he would often come into Shear and he, the following week after he would come in and say, what I said was wrong. And then Rav Shachar said, then he would yell at us and he would say, how'd you let me get away with that? Clearly what I was saying didn't make any sense. And, uh, but that was always... I've, I've heard the Rav, uh, Rav Shachter would say that sometimes, you know, in the yeshiva there's a cycle of mesechlis. They learn with five, six, seven mesechlis, and every five, six, seven years they go through the whole thing again. So the Rav gave shir for 45 years. So Rav Shachter was in a shir, I don't know how many years, many, many years. So on the third go-around, um, so the Rav would say over, he was working through a piece of the Gemara, and he would come to a certain conclusion. Rav Shachter would say, uh, Rebbe, that's not the conclusion you drew last time. I know, I remember the Rosh Hashanah has a memory. We learned the Sugya differently last time. 
And it's like, okay, this is how I see it now. <laughs> uh, that, that's how I, like, I'm not, I'm not here to give sheer just to be a recorder and to repeat what I did seven years ago. I'm learning now. And now after seven years of additional learning, I see it this way. So that's, this is how I learn it now. And that's, uh, that, I don't want to, well, who cares what I said seven years ago? This is what I see now, 70 faces to Torah, and this is the way, there's no other way to see it. This is how I see it. That, that, um, that, that strength, the forcefulness in getting a, a truth in Torah as a person outside of the shirum, he was the sweetest of the sweets. And he was a rabbi's rabbi. Rivera Wine uh, tells, again, he had many interactions with him, that he, used to, he was a rabbi in Miami Beach, Rabbi Wine. So he would see a lot of Rabbanim would come through. So one of the Rabbanim who came through was the Rosh would come through. Um, and so he would give shiurim um, when he was there. And uh, Rabbi Wine said he always would try to attend when he could. And they would strike up a conversation. And he said, you always would ask me. Rabbi Wine was a young rabbi at the time. He said, what are the issues that, the young, that a young rav faces? Tell me what's... Like, what are the troubles? What are the problems? What's it like having a community as a young American rabbi? You always wanted to be involved, and the rabbi Wein would say, I'm dealing with this and dealing with that, and the rabbi would say, ah, I'm dealing with that in Boston. Ah, my grandfather, he dealt with that in Brisk. It's all the same. And he would say, Rabbi Wein says, he would say to me, guess what? No one's ever going to solve it. <laughs> this is what it is. These are the issues of what it's like to have a Jewish community. So, you know, deal with it. And that relationship for Rabbi Wein says, I used, he, uses, he used the Rav as a sounding board for many, many years. Um, he would visit him in YU, um, and he was a, uh, he was a, a source of support uh, to him. He tells one story, I just have to share, it's an amazing story. Rabbi Wein, after he left Miami Beach, he took a position as the executive director in the OU, and shortly after that, he was shifted to the head of the Kashrus division. So he was running Kashrus, which Rabbi Wein describes as a miserable position. Uh, very, very difficult. And he says almost all the issues we had had nothing to do with Kashrus. Kashrus was easy. It was all of the pressures and the politics from all the different factions. Like, he says, unbelievable. So he said one issue that they had shortly after, they, after he started was uh, with El Al. El Al at that time still was flying on Chavez. And they had a food provider, I think it was called Born, uh, Bornstein's, which since doesn't exist anymore. And they, OU gave the hashkacha to the food uh, that provided the food for the airlines. Um, and in the three months before Rabbi Wine took over, there was a vacancy in the position. And in that time, LL switched their flight schedule and they left 40 minutes after sunset on Saturday night. 40 minutes after sunset on Saturday night is, for most opinions, still Shabbos or just at the very end of Shabbos. And so if you're taking off 40 minutes after sunset, so, uh, besides the fact that the Orthodox community certainly couldn't take care, advantage of the flight, which is not such a big deal, whatever it was, but they had a problem getting the food. So they were getting the food on Shabbos from the warehouse, or wherever it was, and bringing it over. And eventually, the OU found out about it. Now, there's probably a way around it, but it violated every policy that a kosher organization has, that you come and you get the, um, the food on Shabbos. So the OU abandoned, and they said, you, we're not delivering the food until an hour after uh, sunset, which means that they couldn't depart until about an hour after two hours, based on the schedule. And as Rabbi Wine tells the story, he says, you have no idea what this created. He got phone calls from every single person in Israel. They got from the consulate, from the embassy, <laughs> everybody that they switched the schedule on El Al and they forced El Al to now fly an hour and a half after Shabbos. It got, and then he gets a call from the Rav. Rabbi Wine, as the head of the OU, Kashrus gets a call from the Rav, and the Rav says, I want to talk to you about El Al. He says, yes, Rabbi. So he said, I got a call from a member of Knesset from the religious party, called me to address this issue that how can we, this is this uh, terrible thing that we threw off El Al's schedule, and you know, everyone's claiming anti-Semitic and anti tzioni you know, all the, so the religious member of Knesset calls the Rav and says, I need you to work with Rabbi Wine at the OU, figure this out. So Rabbi, so Rabbi Wine says, uh, okay. So Rabbi the Rav Soloveitcher, the Rav says, do you want to know what I told him? So he says, yes, Rabbi, what did you tell him? He said, I told him, if it would be Swiss air, I would find a hatter. But for El Al, what the OU says, no permissibility, we're not changing. They're not going to deliver the food till an hour after Shabbos, and that's the way it's going to be. And Rabbi said, that was the end of the discussion. He didn't get another phone call from anybody. And it wasn't a halachic issue, it was a policy issue. Halachically, they could have found this, that, and the other. The OU has a policy, the standards, and when the Rav says, that's the way it's going to be, 
that was simply the way it was going to be, and that's uh, that's how it uh, that's how it went. Um, interestingly, he said another story of Rabbi Weiner that uh, the Rav gave a texture to a product in Boston, and the OU didn't accept it. The OU did not accept the product that the Rav gave a hechsher to him. Well, they wouldn't use it under anything under the OU. If you wanted to use that product in the manufacturing and the production of the product, you couldn't use that product. And if I whine, tells us, I always felt like, it was just bizarre. I, I mean, this is my Rebbe. My, he wasn't his actual uh, You know, this is Rosolovitchik. He gives the hechsher. <laughs> but it was a prior policy before Rabbi Wine took over uh, the OU kashras. And um, he dreaded the day that it would come up. And eventually it came up. And the Rub mentioned once this policy, this product. And Rabbi Wine said, I know. It. And then the Rub said, but you want, I wanted to tell you something. He said, I never want the OU to accept this product. He said, why not? So the Rub said to him, because this product is kosher. I give my own hashkacha to it. But it's not up to the standards of the OU. It's kosher. And, and kosher standards are a thousand standards. So for my people in Boston, I said it's OK but it's not up to your standards. And I don't want you to ever change your standards. I want the OU to represent what it needs to represent. It has to have a high certain standard. And I'm telling you, even though I'm giving my hexer to it, it's good for the community that I need over there for whatever reasons as every Rob needs in his community is ready to do, but it's not up to the national standards of OU and what the OU needs to be. I don't want you to ever accept it. And Wine said the brilliant, not only did he get it, that he made me at ease over this situation, but can you imagine this? What a, what a fascinating situation, which the Rav is giving a hefshu to a product, and he himself says, but it's not a, it's kosher. I wouldn't give my hefshu on it otherwise. But you know, there's kosher, and then there's, and the OU has to have a certain standard, and I want that standard to be upheld, um, despite, uh, despite that. <laughs> One last anecdote with Rabbi Wine. He tells a great series of anecdotes. Have to tell you. So after the OU, Rabbi Wine became the Rav in Munzi. He was Rosh Hashiva and the Rav of his shul in Munzi. See, he married off a, the president of his shul's son to the granddaughter of Rabbi Lamb. I forgot exactly the details. It was uh, you know, his president to the president of Yeshua University's granddaughter. It was a big to-do. And of course, the Rav was going to be the Masader, uh, Masader Kedushin. So uh, the ksuva that they had produced was one of those fancy, well over $1,000. He's never seen anything like it before. Um, and so everyone is sitting there at the head of the table with the dais is the rav of the, uh, of the, the chasan and the, the, whatever side it was, doesn't matter. And the rav is filling it out and he sees there's something about it he doesn't like, the way that it was uh, done. He, 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 he says, ah, these fancy ksuvas. And in front, at the chasan's tish, rips the whole thing in half, puts it aside, takes out a yellow piece of uh, legal pad paper, and by heart starts writing out uh, a nuksuva. So the chassan is white. <laughs> Absolutely just speechless. Rabbi Wine says, he turns to me, and he says, I'm like, can you believe these fancy suvas? They never get it right. And Rabbi Wine has nothing to say. Like, just, you couldn't, but he writes the whole thing out, and he says to the chassan, I'm going to give you something 10 times more valuable than any fancy schmancy ksuva you can ever have. And he has, and, he's, and Rabbi Wine says now, it's 20, 30 years later, can you imagine something any more valuable than a handwritten ksuva from the Rav? Um, anyway, but it was, it, it was a, what needs to be a truth, and that's the way, uh, that's the way that, it was, uh, that it was going to be. His shiurim, let me give you a quote from one of his students. His shiurim were the most captivating shiurim I was privileged to hear in, uh, in my life. The excitement, the heightened expectations that he engendered, together with the scintillating analysis, left one riveted and transfixed. In the course of his shiurim, we were catapulted to absolute heights of kedusha. I felt as I were soaring on the wings of eagles, having been wafted on a magic carpet of sorts. He was a masterful, masterful darshan. His understanding of Torah, the way he put things together, and he was an orator with enthusiasm and charisma. You needed a dictionary to listen to him. Whether he was speaking in Yiddish or English, which was probably his third language, to read his works, you, you have to have a dictionary, no matter what language he was speaking in. And the, the excitement, the passion that he had when he taught left his students literally in, in awe. He would give shiurim, um, he, had, he had weekly shiurim, both in Boston and in New York. 
And then he gave an annual Yorkshire shear, the Yorkshire of his father, the third of uh, Shvat. He would give a shear, he would pack literally 1,500 people. I know, I, I was in high school in that building. Um, he would pack the auditorium, 1,500 people, and he would darshan for four hours, two hours um, <laughs> in halacha, and two hours in agadata, and he would just go uh, straight. Uh, he gave tshuva drushes, which were later published in a series of, uh, of works as well. Um, and, and they were just, people were, it, it was, you were raptured, raptured by, by the way that he spoke and the, the, the level of, uh, of learning that he was able to convey. Um, it was, I've heard it described as a mechanic that you would take a fancy car, break it down into its most basic pieces, show you how each piece worked, and then put the whole thing back together so you understood it. Like, oh, of course. So I didn't understand a thing before I looked at this piece of Talmud, this passage, and I don't understand the start from there. And then he would break it down, starting from the beginning, working its way up, and then put the whole thing back together in a way that was just this magnificent, uh, magnificent piece. And it came because of his uh, deep personal relationship with, with Torah. And uh, I just need to share a few anecdotes to describe, because that's really where it came from. We, we described already how his mother gave him uh, the life of mitzvahs, how she gave him his soul of what it meant to keep Shabbos. But he, he had this intimate relationship with the Torah itself. And he used to often quote, Rabbi Shechter says, he used to quote a uh, Gemara, I'm sure many of you have heard that the, the Gemara says that when an, an, an infant, an uh, embryo, is in its mother's womb, there's an angel that comes and teaches it, call it Torah Kula, teaches it all of Torah, and then when the child is born, it uh, gets a little tap on its lip, and he forgets everything. So the Rav used to say, well, why is that necessary? If you forget everything anyway, what's the value of, of learning it all? And the Rav used to explain, because that would give it, it's a part of who you are. Every Jew is connected to Torah deep inside of his soul, even before he learns the Aleph base. But for his entire life, he takes with him a personal connection. It's mine. It's who I am. It's the air I breathe. And so that when you then engage in the study of Torah, you're just connecting to a piece of, of who you are. And he would quote the Gemara, Torah tziva lanu Moshe, mo rasha ki hilat Yaakov, Torah is our inheritance. It's a mo rasha. And the Gemara has a drasha in which it reads it as if it says meurasa. We're, there's two stages of a wedding, erisin and kiddushin. Erisin is when the groom gives his bride uh, the wedding ring. And then the final step is standing under the chuppah and the sheva brachos. But that first stage, everyone is considered engaged, has a relationship with Torah. Then you have to work to make it into the second stage of the soon, where it's yours. You have an intimate knowledge, but it's part of who you are. And that's literally how how he lived. And uh, I, I want to bring that out, but in order to bring that out, I need to just backtrack to a couple of other, uh, of other stories to really describe that. Um, that I, his, wife, his wife passed away uh, young in 1967, relatively young in 1967. And he, was, he went into a terrible mourning period. It was actually a terrible year for him. He lost not only his, his wife, but his mother and a brother in that same, in a 12-month period. Uh, it, and he was noticeably... Uh, terribly depressed, particularly from the loss, um, from the loss of his wife. I actually want to read to you something which he he described in one of his tshuva drushes um, before uh, before Yom Kippur. It's I think a final source on page six. No, nope. uh, the, the top of page six. Very very poignant piece. He writes, on the seventh day of Pesach in 1967, the Rav died at Cholomoy Pesach himself, uh, 30 years later. Um, I awoke from a fitful sleep, he describes. A thunderstorm was raging outside, and the wind and rain blew angrily through the window of my room. Half awake, I quickly jumped to my feet and closed the window. I then thought to myself that my wife was sleeping downstairs in the sunroom next to the parlor, She'd been in a hospital bed at the end of her life, and I remembered that the window was left open there as well. She could catch pneumonia, which in her weakened state would be devastating. I ran downstairs, rushed into her room, and slammed the window shut. I then turned around to see whether she had awoken from the storm or was still sleeping. I found the room empty, the couch where she slept neatly covered. In reality, she had passed away the previous month. The most tragic and frightening experience was the shock that I encountered in that half second when I turned from the window to find the room empty. I was certain that a few hours earlier I had been speaking with her. And then at about 10 o'clock she had said goodnight and, and retired to her room. 
could not understand why the room was empty. I thought to myself, I just spoke with her. I just said goodnight to her. Where is she? A, a very poignant human piece that is uh, very powerful for unfortunately lost is a reality that we all experience th that shock a month, two months, three months later of what, what? I, I ran downstairs to take care. I turned around and, and she's not there. And he gave this as part of his tshuva drasha of the shock of, of Rosh Hashanah, of Yom Kippur, of living a life in which you think a certain reality and then all of a sudden awaking to the new reality and that perpetual shock that I, 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 I'm familiar with this piece I've spoken about so many times at a shiva house with those suffering a loss of the reiteration, the reliving, the pain and he expresses it in such a human, such a personal, such a raw, a raw experience. And that entire, uh, he, he mourned for years uh, the loss of his wife. Um, uh, uh, Rabbi J.J. Shachter, I quoted earlier, uh, I mentioned the Rav never went to Eretz Yisrael. He went in 1935, and he never went back. And we're going to see what a, uh, a religious Zionist he was. And it was odd that he never went, his whole life, he never went back. He died in 1993, never. Rabbi J.J. Shachter said, he said he didn't hear this from him, but he understood from him um, that um, when he was in Boston, in the, in the, when he started in New York in 1940, for years, his wife said to him, we need, we need to go to go visit Israel. And he, he always was too busy. He, was, oh, he never stopped teaching. Summers, always, between the shul and, and school in Boston and Yeshiva University, it was always another, another season, another season, another season, another season. Always push it off. And finally, after years, in, in 1966, he said, finally, we'll, we'll go this summer. <clears throat> and that summer she took ill, and she died. They never were able to go, and she died the following uh, season, the following spring of 1967. And then the war broke out in June of 67, and Rabbi J.J. Shachter said that the Ruh, he couldn't go. Couldn't go without her. His whole life she wanted to go. And he kept saying, we'll go, we'll go, we'll go, we'll go. And then she died. And, and for the rest of his life, he couldn't go. And, and for all that he stood, and we'll see by the end, what, what the value that he placed uh, and the representation that he, he was for the entire uh, Zionist, modern Orthodox world, he couldn't go. And just, it wasn't a philosophical thing. It wasn't a theological thing. It was a human thing just couldn't get himself uh, to go. Rabbi Wine, and this is all leading up to what I want to get to in a moment, Rabbi Wine says that he used to call him always before Yantiv. And um, after his wife died, when he would call, Rabbi, Rabbi, the Rav would say to Rabbi Wine that he's uh, terribly lonely. Terribly lonely. And he said to Rabbi Wine, he said, loneliness is the greatest, worst punishment that a human being can experience in life. It's, it's the worst. And he would say, as a, as a human, he's just, he was just terribly lonely after the death of his wife. And he told Rabbi Wine, and this circles back to the point that I wanted to make, is there's only one solace that I have in life from the loneliness that I experience. When I walk into my shiru, and I open up my Gemara, and I'm sitting with Rav, Rav and Abaye, and Rashi's by my side, and together we're fighting with Tosfus. And then the Rambam comes into the room, and the Rambam says, you're learning it all wrong. It's not like what Rashi says, it's like this. And then I would pick up the Rambam, and I would understand where he's coming from. And then I would feel my grandfather, Reb Chaim, on my shoulder, and Reb Chaim would say to me, you see how the Rambam's learning? And then I would say to him, yeah, but what about what Tosus said? And when I'm together with Rashi, with Tosus, and Ravina, and Rambam, and Abaye, that's my only solace from the loneliness. And then when I close my Gemara, and I walk out of my room, I'm overcome. I'm overcome with my grief and my loneliness. But that was such a human experience that he would describe uh, of both his relationship, his deep, passionate, intimate relationship with learning, with his Gemara, and, his, and, the, and the human personality, the side that he had um, from his life, uh, life experiences. He uh, was an amazing combination of a Mesorah. He was a person who had a tradition. He learned with his father, I mentioned, until his early 20s. And everything he said in learning, he would quote his father, quote his grandfather. He was, I'm making the, this is the tradition that I have. He had a tradition, or Shafta would say, he had three Mesorahs that he would go. I have a Mesorah in learning. I have a Mesorah in how to paskin, how to answer a Shiloh. 
And he had a Mesorah in Hashkafa. And how a Jew is supposed to think? How a Jew believes? What a Jew is allowed to believe? What a Jew is not to believe? All of that requires a Mesorah. You have to have the tradition. What we do, what we don't do. How we think and how we don't think. How do you pass in a Shiloh? Schefter said he once complained in a published essay that he feels he succeeded in teaching his students Torah, but he did not succeed in teaching his students how to feel about the Torah. He complained, he rude, that he felt he was unsuccessful in giving over the passion, giving over the sentiments, giving over the attitude that he got from his father and grandfather and from his mother, that he wasn't able to convey. He conveyed the learning, but he wasn't able to convey the attitude. He once complained about that. So I think it's interesting. I saw in all the eulogies and all that I was looking around, one of the students wrote the following about him. I put it in here. I think, it's, I think the Rav would have been very proud to have seen this. The student said, I forgot almost all of the classes that I took with my Rebbe, but I once had the privilege to sit at his Seder table, and I'll never forget the way he said Hallel at the Seder table. And I think that would be a great solace to the Rav, that indeed, while he himself might have felt that he failed in conveying some of the feeling and the emotion and the passion and the attitude, it's not quite uh, as dire as he might have thought that uh, his students' experience of, the, of his passion of learning, of what it meant to say halal at the Seder table uh, with the Rav, uh, did in fact, uh, was transmitted uh, from one, uh, generation, uh, one generation to the next. That was a little bit uh, about his place uh, just, in, uh, just in learning. Um, we need to discuss this on page three. He was also a, he was a philosopher, and he was the father of what we would define today of uh, modern orthodoxy. The, the current tagline of Yeshiva University, Torah Umada, Torah and Secular Wisdom, and he stood for and deepened the idea of the synthesis of these two ideas of the best of religious Torah scholarship combined with the best of secular scholarship in Western civilization. And I'd like to share a little bit with you uh, one of his seminal works, The Lonely Man of Faith, which he published in uh, 1965. I gave you a, a long quote on the first quote in your addendum. We don't have time to go through the, uh, the whole thing, but I want to share a little bit uh, because it's, uh, it's such a classic work and so oft, uh, oft quoted. Uh, he's discussing in this, uh, it's on the top of page four, uh, there are two accounts in the beginning of Bereshis of the creation of man, of Adam. Um, Adam one, he calls him, and Adam two, Adam one and Adam two, in two consecutive chapters. And the descriptions the Torah gives are a little bit different, and he goes through an entire analysis, which we're not going to uh, go through. But he begins that the nature of the dilemma can be started in a three-word sentence. I am lonely. Now this loneliness is a different type of loneliness than he's one experienced two years later, which is the human loneliness of the death of his wife. This loneliness, he says, is not that I'm alone, but he's lonely as an observant Torah Jew in the modern world. And what he means and what he expresses in the second paragraph is, he says, what does a man of faith do? He's a stranger in modern society. Because on the one hand, the modern society is technically minded, self-centered, and self-loving. This is still in the 60s. Forget about what he would say now. Almost in a sickly, narcissistic fashion, honor upon honor, piling up victory upon victory, reaching for the distant galaxies, placing a man on the moon. What can a man of faith, who lives by a doctrine which has no technical potential, by a law which cannot be tested in a laboratory, a, a halachic man who's steadfast in his loyalty to this vision of fulfillment that doesn't work. Where does he belong in such a world? A utilitarian society whose practical reason, what do I do, where am I? So he says that, this incongruity, which is getting back to the two accounts of creation, is not in an alleged dual tradition like the Bible critics would contend, but in a dual man. That mankind in the Rav was famous for always finding it throughout, as he did in learning, being able to find the Chakira, two different sides of looking things, two different aspects, two different traits. And so there are two versions of man. One, and, the, and the, they're not an imaginary contradiction, but two versions, in a real contradiction in the nature of man. The two accounts deal with the two Adams, which are two men, two fathers of mankind, two types, two representatives of humanity. And it's no wonder that they're not identical. When he describes them, it's pages upon pages. So I brought a brief 
synopsis written by, Rabbi, uh, by Dr. David Schatz, as I mentioned earlier. The first Adam, these are not the words of the Rebbe, these are the words of David Schatz um, summarizing it, seeks to fill the earth and subdue it, meaning to conquer, to create, to dominate, to control. This was later made famous by David Brooks, what he calls um, resume virtues and eulogy virtues. We live, the, David Brooks made this famous, it's so fa fascinating, and he always quotes the Rav, he quotes from Joseph Soloveitchik for giving him this idea that there's one type of us which is a resume virtue. We want to accomplish, we want to fill the world with things and dominate. And that's Adam 1, to harness and to dominate the elemental nature of forces and use them to their disposal. But Adam the second, which David Brooks refers to as uh, 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 eulogy virtue, has different goals. He's not interested in how things work and controlling them. He wants to know why do the cosmos exist at all? What's the message? What's the inner experience, this life, this loneliness, this awareness of his uniqueness? What's the goal? He thirsts for redemption. That are, those are the two functions of man, and they're contradictory, and they both exist within us at all times. The part of us that wants to control, to dominate, and the part of us that just wants to feel like, why are we here? What's the meaning of all of this? And they're both there, and as the Rav expresses at great length, the lonely man of faith trying to find his way in a world in which the world only exists in the secular world, in Adam 1, but a religious man, a man of faith, says it's more than just conquering the world. What's the point of all of this? And trying to find his way to synthesize his existence in a secular world with, and infuse it with uh, religious, uh, religious meaning. Uh, Halachic Man, which I gave you, it's on page uh, uh, 6, uh, the summary as well, in which he describes again as he does Cognitive Man, Religious Man, and Halachic Man. So he describes that the uh, goal is Halachic Man, which means that he sees the world through the realm of Halacha. What does Jewish law tell me that I need to do in this circumstance? That's the glasses that I wear that allow me to interpret uh, 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 things around me. Uh, just the, the second to last paragraph, just as an example he describes. For halachic man, seeing the first light of dawn is not just an aesthetic experience. Oh, how beautiful. Rather, his first thought is, oh, time to say Shema. I see the world and the beauty of it and how it relates to my life as a Jew. That's an amazing experience. Is there a brach I'm supposed to make on this experience? Am I supposed to say Shema right now? I encounter a natural spring of water. Could that be used as a mikvah? Could it not? I, I see the world through those halachic uh, glasses. If you want to read more, you can see there. Um, and you can certainly look up online more. But we have more to cover, so I want to keep moving so we can finish this up. This tension between modernity and orthodoxy really manifests itself in almost all areas of his uh, public life. For example, he defended the authority of the rabbinate, which was a big issue in the 60s and the 70s. He fought against halachic change, meaning he was against the campaign of mixed seating in, uh, in shul. He opposed theological dialogue with reform and conservative on a theological level, but he pioneered Talmudic education for girls. He abandoned the Brisker family tradition uh, by supporting Zionism, which we'll get to in a moment. He advocated cooperation with the non-Orthodox, even with the Christians, in pursuit of social justice. So when it came to theology, he didn't want to talk with the Christians or a reform or conservative. When it came to social, of course we have to join together with them to be the best that we can and to aid. And it was always a balance of a halachic man living in a modern secular world, and how do we bridge this gap, this new world um, that, we are, uh, that we are in. Last major piece that I want to cover with you is his uh, position on Zionism, a major, major piece um, as part of his life. He came from this uh, Brisker dynasty, the Soloveitchik family, which were anti-Zionist, and he was originally a member of the Aguda. And that changed with the Holocaust and the years following the Holocaust. And uh, uh, he put that in a lecture, which became a book called Kol Dodi Dofeik, which is a phrase from Shir Hashirim, the, the knock of my beloved, or my beloved is knocking, depending on how we we'll translate that, which was translated into English with the title Fate and Destiny in 1956. He delivered this lecture on Yom Ha'atzma'ut in Yeshiva University in 1956 to set the context of this discussion, this book, this lecture that he originally gave. 1956 was on the cusp of another war. The, the, the winds of war already began in 1955. Uh, the, US, the Israeli government had already asked the U.S. for military aid and were denied because the U.S. was still trying to deal with Russia and with Nasser and Egypt, and they didn't want to get involved. And it was a frightening time for the fledging Jewish state. 
and in the back of everyone's mind is the Holocaust. We're eight years removed. Nine years, eight years removed from the state, 10 years removed, 11 years removed from the end of the Holocaust. No one has forgotten. And the, the fear of another Holocaust to all the Jews who had now made it and were in this fledging state, this eight-year-old state in Israel, was the cloud that loomed over this time period. And on Yom Atzmut, 1956, with the American apathy that was still a sour taste in everyone's mind from World War II, what's going to be now with 1956? And the Rav delivers this lecture, Kol Dodi Dofeik, in, in a couple of sections. The opening section, he gives a, a thesis on the idea of suffering. He opens the discussion with personal suffering. So even though he, he's going to lead into the, the Holocaust and, and Zionism, he has a major approach on suffering, which we'll, we'll, we'll present as a parenthetical thing. I, I gave it to you on, uh, I think it's this page four. Uh, we'll mention just briefly, in, in which she discusses um, the idea of suffering. He has a, a, one basic comment, which I'll mention. You can read the whole thing there. That is, a Jew does not ask the question of why. That question, why did this happen, is not a theological question that a Jew can ask because we don't have an answer to that question. And it's of no value to ask theological questions that have no answer. All that that does is it paralyzes us. But what a Jew needs to ask is, what am I to do in this situation? What is it that I'm required to act? How is it that I'm required to respond to this personal tragedy, to the national tragedy. What does God want from me in this Why did he put me in this situation? Good luck. I don't know. Moshe Rabbeinu can't answer that question. Shlomo Mela can't answer that question. And certainly anybody living through the, whatever tragedy we're living through doesn't have an answer to the why did this happen. What is my job in this situation? What is my task? What is my response? That is an empowering healthy question, and he uses that to describe the difference between what he calls fate and destiny. Fate is just being thrown along uh, history. Things happen to you. Destiny is taking, so to speak, the bull by the horns and saying, what do I make of the situation that I have been placed in? What am I to do with these circumstances that I've been given? I don't want these situations. I don't like these circumstances. I don't know why I'm in this. It doesn't matter. What am I to do with this? So you can read that inside. And he uses that to then springboard into his uh, uh, position on Zionism. It's 1956. The, the more religious, what we would call Haredi Yeshivish approach was very anti-Zionistic at this time. And if you remember from all the previous classes we discussed, because the Zionist movement was passionately anti-religious. And the Rav, breaking from that, which took a tremendous amount of courage, in today's day and age it's a little bit different, tremendous amount of courage, um, described the six knocks, six knocks on the door. And what he did is he developed a thesis, a beautiful, beautiful approach, based on the Pasuk and Shir Hashir, the My Beloved Knocks. And Shir Hashim describes the reunion between two lovers who had been separated for a, an amount of time. And uh, the male, the husband, uh, we don't know exactly, whatever, comes home and he knocks on the door. And his beloved is already in bed. And she's already changed into her pajamas. And she says, I can't get out of bed. And he's knocking. And she says, it's too late. And he's knocking. And she says, I already changed. I'm going to have to put on my clothing again. And he's knocking. And she says, I'm going to have to put on my slippers. I don't have the, I don't have the kayak. And then finally, she drags herself out of bed and opens up the door. And her beloved is gone. And the Rav said, trying to empower and galvanize the American Jewish community, he said, it's time. And our beloved is knocking. And the only question is, are we going to open up the door? And he quantified six knocks, which I have in very brief, um, uh, on the top, middle of page five, the end of the first paragraph, first box. He said, here are the six knocks that are taking place. And what he did is he put into words things which everybody was sort of aware of, but weren't able to put into the historical context the way that he did in his beautiful, uh, eloquent la language. He said, number one, in the political arena, the fact that we were given the state and that world powers have come together and acknowledged the Jewish state in a way that had not happened in 2,000 years 
We have a, in the political arena uh, in alliances between Russia and the U.S. in regards to Israel, which, had, which were unheard of in the, in the times of the Cold War. This is, there's something happening that's shifting the, the sands of time. It's happening in front of us, in the battlefield. The Jews won in 1948. This is still even before 67. But if we, we won. The last Jewish <laughs> a victory in a battlefield was, was the, was the you know, 2,000 years prior. We won a war. The theological disproof to a thousand years of Christianity. For a thousand years, since the Middle Ages, the Jew had been badgered by the Christians that you've been abandoned. We are now the chosen people, and look, we measure in the billions, and you, maybe a billion, certainly hundreds of millions, and you, nothing. Downtrodden, inquisitioned, pogroms, holocaust, we're it. And we didn't really have a response. We could say we believe. And then all of a sudden, in 1948, there's a, a state of Israel is reborn, unheard of in the history of mankind, that a people exiled for 2,000 years comes home. And as much as people, says the Rav, there was a knock that said, a thousand years of our history was just flipped on its head. A thousand years of theological arguments with a single vote all of a sudden it became, oh really? Where's the church now and where are we? That was knock number three. In the hearts of perplexed and assimilated youths describing the invigorated feeling of Zionism, of a return to Judaism, that Jewish blood is not free. Jewish blood had been free for a thousand years. Killed in the streets throughout Europe and there was no one to turn to, no one who cared. And now there was. Now there was a country that went after wherever in the world when they pulled Eichmann out of Argentina. This, this is, now he wasn't writing specifically about that, that idea that there is a country and that Jewish blood is not free. And lastly, the fact that the gates of our homeland were opened. He said, Hashem is knocking. The beloved is knocking. And the response of the Jew is, open the door. And he, in a bold and daring break from his family and from the world that he came from, left the Aguda and joined Mizrahi and said, we must support Zionism and the state of Israel. And that has become the position, now it's already again, it's easy. It's easy today. Even the camps that were anti-Zionist, it's a different world 50 years later. But then was a very, very uh, a bold, uh, and uh, he spent the rest of his life as the outcast in a certain way with his family. In learning, nobody could touch him. Nobody could touch him. Not in Brisk, not in Lakewood, not in Chaim Berlin. Everybody knew that he was the Galdo that he wasn't learning. But in his approach to Zionism, and some other not learning, boys and girls learning, he did a number of things which did not fly in that world, and he was always, therefore, on the outside, despite being the sign of the dynasty that he was, and his brilliance in learning, but they don't call him the father of modern orthodoxy for nothing, because he did and created a world that was significantly different than the world, uh, than the world that he came. Um, but over his 45 years, uh, of giving shir, as I mentioned, ordaining over 2,000 uh, 2, rabbis, he has put his stamp in a way um, that uh, cannot be, uh, will, will never be fully even grasped and cannot be denied. Uh, I'll leave with two last quotes. In, back in 1935 already, he wrote after his trip to uh, what was then called Palestine, he said, the future of Palestine is with orthodoxy, just as the future of orthodoxy lies in Palestine. I make the statement not as a rabbi, but as an objective observer. 1935, this is still 13 years before the state and way before he writes his 1956 article. That's where he saw the future of Palestine is with orthodoxy, and the future of orthodoxy is with Palestine. Prophetic words which have indeed uh, come true. I'll let me conclude with a quote from Rabbi Norman Lamb, uh, in a 1993 eulogy that he delivered. Um, um, 
discussing this, uh, uh, the, ha the legacy of the Rav. To be remembered as a philosopher, to be uh, as a traditional rabbi, he said the Rav was not a Lamdin who happened to have and use a smattering of general culture. He wasn't just a learned Jew who happened to know how to use general culture to his, uh, to his advantage. And he was certainly not a philosopher who happened to be a Talmud Chacham. Which one was he? Was he a Talmud Chacham who happened to know a lot of secular studies? Was he a, a philosopher who happened to be a Talmud Chacham? Because he was neither. We must accept him on his terms as a highly complicated, profound, and broad-minded personality who encompassed really all of that. And the legacy that he left, the stamp that he gave to the, uh, to the American Jewish scene um, through, his, uh, through his learning, uh, we didn't even really get to because uh, I'm already a little bit over time. There, there's the, the numbers of books that continue to be published, the number of commentaries of his, there wasn't an aspect of Torah that he didn't comment on that a student has notes on that is not now publishing. 25 years later, there just now came out with a, a commentary of Chumash in the last couple of years, his commentary on, on Chumash, dozens and dozens, probably hundreds of books on him from students, on their recollections, his commentary, his uh, sermons, uh, it's unending because he commented on everything and he had an insight on everything, a philosophical approach to everything. Uh, and he was, uh, he was the Rebbe. Uh, the Rebbe of Yeshiva University, the Rebbe of Modern Orthodoxy uh, in America. And uh, I know that I did not do it justice because there were so many other aspects which I didn't uh, cover, but I hope as a final uh, installment of our 20 weeks together uh, that I gave a, a, a flavor, a, a taste of, uh, of the Rav, Rav Yosef Dov Salavechik, uh, Rav Yosef Ber, um, and uh, as he was referred to, and uh, we conclude uh, with a wonderful, really, series of 20 weeks, a tremendous amount of learning that we've done together. And uh, Kolek, what again to you for coming uh, week in and week out. Uh, we'll have some other sessions, I guess, throughout the summer. And then uh, next year, after Circus, we'll start uh, series number two, um, which will uh, roll out. Uh, so that um, that uh, brings our uh, lecture series to a close for now. Uh, just uh, series, number, uh, series number one. I'll dab a marv in shul, and I wish you all a wonderful evening. <laughs>